Well, friends, welcome back to another episode of The Andrew Giuliani Show, a Thanksgiving episode. A couple things I really want to focus on. First off, that uh, Joe Biden is going to get a uh, nice good old finger wagging and a tongue lashing for his classified documents. That sounds like it's really going to affect any of the illegal activity that Biden has been doing over the course of, oh, I don't know, let's say the last 50 years. Uh, And then also I want to talk about how the United States Army is now looking to recruit some of their members that they have kicked out because they chose not to get the COVID vaccine. We'll cover that in the second half. But let's get right into the declassification of official documents. Now, this has been something that's been talked about a whole lot since Biden's FBI and Justice Department raided Donald J. Trump at Mar-a-Lago. I was just, by the way, at Mar-a-Lago a few nights ago and was with the president uh, a couple days back. And I have to tell you, uh, it is extremely secure. As president, it was extremely secure. Now, it is extremely secure. There is police and secret service anywhere. You cannot get in the building without having your name on the list where Secret Service actually checks you off that list, either as a guest of the president or as a guest of a member. But then in order to get into the president's corner quarters where the documents were, you have to then go through another uh line of security, if you will, from the U.S. Secret Service that the president or his direct staff has put you on in order to access right that. And then in order to get where the documents were, you would then actually have to get direct authorization from President Donald J. Trump. So we're talking about three very strong layers of security, Uh, unlike what we saw with President Joe Biden, who had documents at the Penn Biden Center, the uh, University of Pennsylvania, known for its Wharton School of Business, but the University of Pennsylvania, uh, which, by the way, was getting donations from the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, Congress is asking about those donations, and they're getting stonewalled at this point from the University of Pennsylvania. They've been focused more on, I guess, the anti-Israeli protests than they are actually giving Congress the information they're requesting. And also... In Joe Biden's basement of, I should say basement, you know, I'm thinking Joe Biden's basement because that's been and probably will be his campaign strategy. But also those documents were in Joe Biden's garage right by his beloved Corvette, where Hunter Biden was staying for many, many days and had direct access to that. So let's go through this a little bit. I've heard recently that... uh, that President Trump basically did not have the authority to declassify. I want to get right into where this says very clearly that the president does have the authority to classify and declassify. First off, you can go right into Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution and you'll see it right there. But then I also want to, uh, and by the way, Article 2 of the Constitution talks about executive authority. And the president is the one that solely has the executive authority within the executive branch. That goes right back to the founders uh, and to one of our founding documents. Um, But then I also want to get into an executive order that was put out by none other than Barack Obama, obviously the 44th president of the United States that talked about classified national security. So as I was doing some research on this, uh, finding out that Biden was not going to be prosecuted by his own Justice Department for the way in which he mishandled his classified documents. Meanwhile, Trump was raided, Mar-a-Lago was raided by Biden's Justice Department in order to try to get the information that President Trump has said he has declassified. President Trump has been saying is actually true, that the president does have the authority to declassify this. Well, shockingly enough, if you actually look in Google or in these search engines, but especially Google, um, what it'll immediately send you to if you ask about classified information and declassifying that information via the U.S. Constitution or executive order, does the president have the authority to do that? Immediately, it will send you to a bunch of liberal articles by CNN, by the liberal-leaning Brennan Center for Justice, by uh, a bunch of different liberal um, law firms that basically say the president does not have the authority. The president has not been proven that. Well, let's take 
President Obama's executive order. And we're going to go to two specific areas of this, because as you can see, this is probably about a 40, 40, 45 page document here. So this is executive order for those of you that want to do a little more research into it and actually follow along with what I'm saying. Executive order 13526, classified national security information. So immediately you can go into onto the second page and see section one dot three dot classification authority and then go to section one uh the authority to classify information originally may be exercised only by the president and the vice president okay so that right there talks about classification authority so in order to go to declassification and downgrading i went into section three dash one uh authority for declassification uh, information shall be declassified as soon as it no longer meets the standard for classification under this order. Skip down to three, right? Actually, let me go through this because it's easier to actually explain this if we go through this. Information shall be declassified or downgraded by the official who authorized the original classification, if that official is still serving in the same position or has original classification authority, two, the originator's current successor in function, if that individual has original classification authority, that doesn't apply here, but three, I'd say this applies pretty clearly, a supervisory official of either the originator or of her, of her successor in function if the, supervis if, the, if the supervisory official has original cl classification authority. So let me repeat that again. Authority for declassification under section 1.3 of President Obama's executive order 13526, classified national security information. A supervisory official of either the originator or his or her successor in function if the supervisory official has the original classification authority. Now, section 1.3, classification authority. The president of the United States has the classification authority, section 1-3. It's as simple as that. Because he has the classification authority in section 1-3 of this executive order put into law by Obama, you go right into Section 3-1, Authority for Declassification. Section 3, a supervisory official of either the originator of his or her successor in function, if the supervisory official has original classification authority. So we've established that the president has orison, original classification authority, and I think it should be extremely obvious to all of us that the ultimate supervisor in the executive branch as written in the Constitution of the United States, is the President of the United States, which states extremely clearly, clearly looking here at Section 1 and then at Section 3, both dash ones of both of them, that the President has the authority to classify information. And a supervisory official, if that supervisory official has the original classification authority, has the ability to declassify the president would certainly qualify under section 3-1 as a supervisory official and as stated in section 1-3 the president has the authority to classify i'm telling you go look at executive order 13526 classified national security information go look at section 1.3 go look at section 3.1 you'll see that the president can classify and then look right at section 3.1 section 3 he has the ability to declassify. Case is closed, basically, with President Donald J. Trump. It's that's it. It's that simple. So everything that you're seeing that we've seen over the last year with this case, where Biden's Justice Department was going after President Trump in all different ways, but going after these classified documents just shows you that this is 100% political and you have the exculpatory evidence right here that Obama, that, that Biden's president, Obama, ended up putting an executive order on. So let's get into Biden now because I wanted to present that exculpatory evidence right there for President Trump, which I'm sure his legal team has. And if not, then I'm definitely going to reach out to them after this and probably send him this exact clip as well. Um, but let's get into Biden now. 
because here in section 1.3, it says that the president and the vice president has the ability to classify. And then in section three, a supervisory official, if that supervisory official has the original classification authority, can declassify. In most of those cases, the vice president may be considered a supervisory official. It's not 100% clear, but I think this could potentially, for his role as vice president with that classified information, give him the ability to say, you know what, I was a supervisory official, I could do that. Okay, so let's say then that the vice president, I say President Biden, says my information while I was vice president, I declassified that information as well. Let's say he says that. Okay, let's set aside all of that classified information that Biden had in his Delaware Beach home, in the Penn Biden Center, which we know the CCP has donated to extensively. And we know, obviously, the Biden family's connections with the Communist Party of China. Let's say all of that, the vice presidential documentation you set aside over here. You still need to explain why President, uh, why Senator Joe Biden, going back to the 1970s, has classified information in his documents. So I've talked about this, I think, on Sid and Friends a few times. I've talk, spoken about this with other people on WABC radio. But I think this is very important to point this out in terms of classified information and how it's handled in the White House versus how it's handled in Congress. So as a staffer, I was a former staffer, obviously, of the president. I wouldn't have classified information in my office. You could not actually have it in your office. I was kind of like a member of Congress in the way that I would have to view said classified information. I would have to go into what is called a skiff. I would leave my phones, any electronic devices outside just like that. And I could not bring those phones or devices in there because they don't want anybody taking that information, taking pictures of said information. I could then view the top secret or classified information, depending on what your level of uh, intelligence classifications were, what you could actually view. Uh, and you'd read that there in that skiff. You take minutes, hours if necessary to read that information there. You would leave that information in the skiff. There would be generally an attendant at the front of that skiff asking if you had left anything you show, nope, I don't have anything. I didn't bring anything in. This is what I walked out with. By the way, they're all recorded in there, as a matter of fact, the entrances, so that way they can see if somebody is actually taking the classified or top secret information, and then you leave that information there. As president or vice president, this classified and top secret information is brought to you by your national security team. A lot of times your national security advisor um, brings said information to you and so as president, you might view it in the Oval Office or there's a little office on the side of the Oval Office where many presidents, including President Trump, spent a lot of their time, a lot of their working hours. That's where you would view that if you were president of the United States. Potentially the same thing as vice president. You can have that information brought to you in the vice president's West Wing office or in the vice president's ceremonial office in the executive office building, the EEOB, which is right across the street. So you can see how through some carelessness, let's say, the vice president may end up putting classified information or a staff might put classified information with uh, actually non-classified information. Okay, again, let's say there was carelessness. Let's say that Vice President Biden at the time did actually declassify. Here there actually may be a path for his legal team if he needed a legal team on this, you might not need a legal team on this, as we're going to talk about in a few short minutes, could actually declassify. How can you explain that as a senator, he actually had classified information mixed in with his documents? It is unexplicable, except for the fact that he was taking classified information out of skiffs and actually bringing them back to his office. Because the truth is, if you're a member of Congress, just like if you are a staff member for the president of the United States, you do not get classified information brought to your office. If you think about it, there are 535 members of Congress. It is way too difficult to for 
security officials, for national security officials to be able to keep track of all those copies of those informations if you're going to serve all of those members of Congress. That's why they've set up SCIFs. That's why they've set up the security so that way members of Congress, senators certainly, would go in to a SCIF to view that classified material. As I said before, you would go through it, you take the time that was needed to, and you would leave the classified material there. There would be an attendant. The attendant would ask, sir, ma'am, did you leave the top secret material here that you reviewed? You would say yes, and you would walk out. What Joe Biden as senator must have done if he took, if classified material was mixed up in his records was simply take the classified material and put it probably somewhere in his suit coat. There is no logical reason or explanation why that material would be in Joe Biden's senator, Joe Biden's person. No no logical explanation whatsoever. So this is very simple. There is nothing in either the executive order 13526, as we talked about earlier, or in Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution or in the Constitution anywhere that says that a senator or member of Congress has the authority to declassify information. It's not there. So the fact that President Trump, where we've presented this exculpatory evidence before, is being targeted by the Biden Justice Department for information which he says he declassified, that he has the the authority as the executive under Article 2 of the Constitution. And then, and I'm going to repeat this one more time. I know I've gone through this a few times, but I think this is so important. It's something that the leftist media is not talking about. So I'm going to do one more quick repeat of this. Executive Order 13529, Classified National Security Information, Section 1-3, classification authority. The president has the authority to classify information. Then, let's go to section 1-3, authority for declassification. A supervisor of the originator, if that supervisor has the original classification authority, it's as clear as day, President Trump could declassify this information through two sources here. President Trump has exculpatory evidence. This should not be going on. This is more of just a political witch hunt. And the fact that Joe Biden is not going to be brought up on charges is defies logic. And it's unconscionable. It doesn't defy logic, I should say, because it defies the law. But what logic tells you is simply the actions of this Justice Department whether it's going after President Trump in every single way that you could possibly imagine or going after, let's say, parents that are fighting against the crazy, radical ideas that gender is a construct and trying to protect their children from actually being in restrooms, in locker rooms with people of the opposite sex. And by the way, the parent that I'm referring to in Virginia, his daughter actually was sexually assaulted by a man who was dressed as a woman who was allowed to wear, who was allowed to be in the ladies' bathroom. So you have the FBI, you have the DOJ that continues to go after Trump's opponents, after anybody who's associated with him, after any conservative causes. And unfortunately, when you have something as egregious as this, where you see the difference between Trump with his classified documents that he said that he declassified, which that gives him the authority to, and Biden with his classified documents that date back to when he was a senator, which he had zero authority through any executive orders, more importantly, through the U.S. Constitution to declassify The Department of Justice should be going after Joe Biden, not after Donald Trump. It's not what logic tells us because what we've seen over the last three years is nothing but political attacks on Joe Biden's opponents. 
on the biggest threat to his presidency, which is Donald J. Trump. But the law tells us, the law tells us that Joe Biden should be held to account, not just with a finger wag or a bad Joe, you shouldn't have done that, but with actually what is instead being heaped on Donald J. Trump right now. Okay, again, go look at Executive Order 13526. I know I've said it time and time again, but just look at those two parts. You don't have to look through the whole thing. I think it's important that you see this. The other thing I want to talk about in this episode here before we wish you a happy Thanksgiving, you and your families a happy Thanksgiving, is something that the Army just recently, a couple days ago, ended up sending to its uh, the people that it uh, fired for not taking the COVID vaccine. So basically, there were 1,900, a little over 1,900, 1,903 active duty soldiers from the United States Army that were let go because they chose not to get the COVID vaccine for a multitude of reasons. Um, Let me get into this. But on top of those, by the way, there were over 8,000 U.S. service members between the Navy, Marines, uh, Coast Guard, Space Force that were let go because they chose to get this. So Brigadier General Hope Rampy, which is the she's the Army Director of Personal Management, ended up saying as a result of the re- rescission of rescission, sorry, as a result of the rescission of all current COVID-19 vaccination requirements, former soldiers who were involuntarily separated for their refusal to receive the COVID-19 vaccine may request a correction of their military records. It also states later in this record that those who are looking for the opportunity to be able to reapply can talk to their recruiter, you know, to their local army recruiter about reapplication. Now, you had uh, almost 9,000 members of the Army, almost 11,000 U.S. Air Force. You had uh, over 4,000 U.S. Navy and 3,700 Marines that sought religious exemptions from this vaccine. The reason why they are now going to a point where they're asking these members to come back because of COVID is because we are actually at a point where we are 8,000 troops short of, I should say, sorry, we are 15,000 troops short of the recruiting goals for the United States Army. And we're actually at a record low. I believe the number is, I don't have it in front of me, but I was reading it before. I believe the number is 432,000 service members at this point, that's a record low since 1940, since before the U.S.'s involvement in the Second World War. Now, there are a couple reasons for that. Certainly, the COVID vaccine requirement uh, was a big part of it in terms of getting more people out. And also, probably people that were going to apply saying, you know what, we don't apply here because of your religious beliefs, because you believe it's best for your body your choice. But also, remember, so much of what we've been hearing in America over the last 8, 10, 12 years is how America is a place that is originally sinned and can't be redeemed. And you're teaching that to our younger generation. When you do that, when you put that cancer in people's head, that false cancer in people's people's head, you're going to have less people as a population that are looking and saying, I want to serve this country. I'm proud to serve this country. I'm proud to make the sacrifice to be able to go out there and defend my country, to defend its freedoms. When in school, you don't teach civics, you glaze over the Constitution. And you basically look at the Constitution as a document that was founded in order to help white colonizers rather than what it is, which is one of the most brilliant documents, certainly most brilliant governing document in the history of our world. Then, of course, you're going to have less people that are going to volunteer to go 
and serve our country. And it's a real problem. And by the way, the reason why locally this also is important too is we're going to see a major problem with this with our NYPD. Maybe we'll talk next week about what canceling the next five classes of the New York Police Department actually means to our city, to a city that's seeing increased crime, and how, as I've said a few times here, New York, we've seen crime go up, but I think we're at a cliff right now. And we could back off that cliff if we actually had the right law enforcement strategies that were backed by the political will to be able to actually change in this city, to actually be able to enforce the laws that are on the books, or we can go right over that cliff. And sadly, pressing the accelerator to go over that cliff are our district attorneys who are not enforcing the law and the record retirements of some of our biggest classes of the NYPD, and now not adding the next five NYPD Academy classes. That's just going to whittle down. And effectively, what does that do? That effectively defunds our police. Look, I'm a big believer in budget cuts in New York City. I campaigned on this for governor. When you look at New York State and New York City, New York State, you're looking at $230 billion. New York City, you're looking at $102 billion. There needs to be cuts. Otherwise, you're going to continue to chase many of our taxpayers out of New York City. They're going to make the risk assessment and say, you know what? I'm not getting the value for the premium that I'm paying. So when you look at what this ultimately means from the police, you can cut budgets all across the city, but you can't cut the NYPD's budget. That is just going to accelerate our beautiful city that we all love so much right over the cliff into despair into the 1980s and look none of us want that at least i think none of us want that when i see district attorneys that are enforcing the law it makes me question even that statement but with that i want to wish you and your families a wonderful thanksgiving it's uh it really is one of my it's probably my it's fourth of july is probably my favorite but then after that thanksgiving i just love being able to spend the time with my family it's also nice to not have to you know go out and buy christmas presents over the course of three four weeks and try to you know figure out what the heck's doing and i'm a terrible wrapper of presents i am always been bad i actually as a kid at one point i think one year when i couldn't figure out the wrapping stuff I ended up getting like tin foil, basically, and I wrapped all my presents in tin foil one year, and I ended up color, uh, coloring it with a bunch of marks and all that stuff. I'm not a very good drawer either, so I think my parents looked at it and said, this kid might be a little bit crazy, and they're probably right, but I digress. Let me wish you and your families a wonderful Thanksgiving. I hope you have the opportunity to all be together. Uh, if for whatever reason you're not together, I hope you get on the phone if there are... Um, if there may be differences in your families, I hope you have the opportunity at least to make a call and to connect and at least say, I love you, you know, whatever, whatever differences we may have as human beings. And I certainly highlight every single week, the differences that we do have and how I really believe that this is a battle for evil uh, of good versus evil. Um, I believe one of the things that good needs to do to prevail over evil is just to show how wonderful the inherent goodness is of those who really preach and love God's word. So to me, Thanksgiving is very important, and uh, I hope that you guys have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And we'll see you back here next week. Again, a little homework if you want. Should take you just a few short minutes. Google Executive Order 13526, and you will see that the president has the authority to classify. And then if you go right to Section 3-1, you'll see the president also has the authority to declassify. Again, Section 1-3, classification authority. Section 3-1, declassification authority. Um, God bless you and God bless your families. Happy Thanksgiving.